And then you went on to um, the strain counter, Lawrence Jones, you're talking about the Jones work, That's, for those of you who know, Lawrence Jones, DO, the strain counter strain work. And, and then the, uh, the work with Janet Travell, um, Janet Travell, as you know, had done a great deal of work um, and a number of books on myofascial pain syndromes and things that she's done working with what we call trigger points or trigger areas. And then also looking at the, at the fascia, as Dr. Garrett mentioned. And when I was still working in the office um, in Detroit, uh, you, that was when you went down to Bandera, Texas, Bandera, and had, Texas, and yeah. had the uh, interaction with her. Yeah. And um, it was a group of dentists, I believe, and there was a forethinking dentist who decided it would be great to have both of you, had heard both of you speak independently, and thought it would be great to hear them both on the same program so they can interact. And um, so you went down to Texas. 25th annual Rose Smith Memorial Lecture, a dental meeting. And we uh, were met by a lovely limousine at the uh, airport in San Antonio, and we drove to Bandera, Texas, where the Dude Ranch was. And on the, on the way out, uh, we sort of introduced each other to each other. And um, I said, I've heard so much about you, and I've read so many of the texts you've written, and I really appreciate what you've done. Um, and uh, I said, uh, I know you've done a lot of work on, uh, on hiccuping. I said, uh, how did you find that out? She said, well, I was with President Kennedy during the White House years, and they had a French cook that uh, was uh, cooking a, um, a French meal uh, at a very um, elaborate state dinner, and one of the prominent guests got a sudden attack of hiccups, and the French cook came out and took a spoon and put a little vinegar in it and then lifted up the patient's, the person's uvula, and the hiccuping immediately stopped. And she said, that's how I learned how to help the hiccuping, which is very important, she says, and it's especially <coughs> post-surgical hiccups. Uh, I've written many papers about that. I said, yes, I have some here, but I wondered how that happened. She said, I learned it from a French cook. Um, uh, so, Dr. Lefleur, <laughs> once again, France rises. Um, so, uh, uh, on, the, on the way out, uh, we were talking to each other, and she said, you know, even though I have a practice with many uh, senators and congressmen in Washington, I still see quite a few children. And she said, and you know, there's a, there's a you might be interested in this, she said, uh, there's a condition that children have um, which uh, is an arthritic condition of the knees, uh, mostly uh, the lower limbs, uh, that is greatly helped by the Wilson factor. I said, yes, I know about that. It's in raw cream. Uh, we use that. She turned around to me. She was in the front seat. She said, do you know there's only 18 people in the whole world that know about the Wilson factor? And I said, Dr. Travell, you're wrong. There are 19. <laughs> Make that 20, it's called Stigmasterol. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we got along very well, uh, and uh, I gave her the clippings I had found about hiccuping, and then she said, well, uh, I've uh, found a way to do research in the office, and uh, my father was an orthopod who gave chiropractic adjustments, and here's a picture of my father giving a sacroiliac adjustment, so I know about you guys. And uh, so when the meeting came, the first time I ever rode a horse to the meeting and then rode a horse back, when the meeting came, uh, there was a fellow who ran the, a, a dental uh, promotional company, uh, uh, how to encourage dental patients to have return visits, have checkups and regular checkups. It was, it was called Cemented Dentics. And uh, uh, he was a very nice guy, a, a very good dentist but not an advertisement for his profession. He had very bad teeth, badly discolored, and, but he had trouble getting his jaws open. He can only open his jaws about one knuckle. You should be able to get three knuckles of your less dominant hand in your mouth, or if you're a speaker, your foot. Uh, <laughs> and he can only get about one. And uh, uh, so Janet Travell did her spray and stretch technique spraying at that time with uh, uh, fluorimethane, which she no longer uses. She now uses ice and, and little cups because of the uh, pollution problems with the ozone and all the rest of it. She stopped the use of fluorimethane. 
but she did that and stretched it and then heated it afterwards. And he was able to get about two knuckles in. And then she turned to me like a, a witness uh, person would be turned to uh, in a court case. She sort of went like that to me. So I did my therapy utilization testing and I did the spindle cell on his masseter and we got three knuckles in and I turned back to her and I went <laughs> <laughs> and she looked at me and I looked at her and at that she was 75 then and I was maybe 52 or 53 I don't know whatever it was she was 25 years or so older we both looked at the audience and we went <laughs> like that and uh, we, had, we just had a hell of a good time together. And uh, um, she said, I've written a book uh, about my years in the White House, and uh, I'd like you to uh, have it. And I said, well, my grandmother, my Irish grandmother said, never be beholden. I said, I've written a book about muscles, and I'd like to have you have that. And she says, you don't give up, do you? And I said, no. And we got to be very good friends. and. Uh, um, uh, Janet uh, discovered that uh, uh, muscles had a, had a trigger point in them and she said that she could palpate it. Uh, I've palpated many, many muscles and I rarely have found the trigger points by palpation, but by accident I found if I palpated what I felt might be a trigger point quite often in the belly or above or below it, that not only would that particular muscle weaken, but every other muscle on that side would weaken. And um, it was that accidental observation that made a lot of sense out of what uh, uh, Dr. Travell had said. Now, do you want anything further on Janet's uh, stuff? Do you, do you guys have something you want to say? Um, Oh, I, I know what I want to say about that. I, I want yeah. to interject and you can help me with that. Yeah. Um, one of the things that happened, and I remember this because I was working in the office from 1975 to 19, end of 1979. Um, actually, I worked one day in 1980 in 542 Michigan, building with Dr. Goodhart and the rest of the group there. Um, that was like 78, I think. And you came back from that, and you had said that one of the things that had astounded you about, about what Janet Travell taught was that what high percentage of her patients she used B12 or folic acid on. Right, right. <laughs> um, she said, I take care of a lot of congressmen, I take care of a lot of uh, children, I take care of a lot of uh, officials, and uh, I have a geriatric type practice, I have an adult practice, also pediatric type practice. But she says, it's extraordinary how many people uh, I use folic acid and B12 with. Well, what we found, uh, for example, in the tennis player's case, was um, if you stretch a muscle uh, and the muscle weakens, that it means you should fascially flush it. But it says that it also needs a nutrient. If you have a muscle that uh, uh, weakens when you uh, contract it, it also means you need a nutrient. Uh, at the um, Winter Olympics, uh, the Canadians had a uh, downhill skier who had been quite successful, his name was Dave Irwin, and he was uh, doing the giant slalom um, against uh, uh, a German uh, fellow, as I recall, and um, I was watching him, uh, Dave Irwin, come down the hill, and he's trying to follow his line, but his, uh, his uh, right knee was drifting laterally and he couldn't hold the line uh, down the, uh, the hill, and he was uh, several seconds behind uh, the German, uh, and I've got a memory loss on his name, uh, something like Stefan or something of that nature. And when I, when I tested him, um, Dave Irwin had muscles like tree trunks. Um, and I reasoned that if his right knee was shifting laterally, the, uh, the muscle which should have, the adductors which should have been pulling in were not pulling in and I found that uh, in a general sense that if you stretch a muscle it certainly shouldn't weaken. 
but when I stretched those muscles, they weakened dramatically. I found that that needed iron. Uh, the addition of iron to his uh, armamentarium in terms of what he was taking uh, not only uh, prevented that after we had fascially flushed the muscle, but uh, uh, that single muscle group, but uh, he beat uh, uh, Stefan or whatever his name was in the giant salon a couple weeks later in the World Cup. He did the repeated testing on him too. Yeah. That's what he well, it out. was repeated testing. Uh, he not only would I did I stretch it, but it was repeated testing. When you repeatedly test it one the hamstring or something. Pardon? What was the deal? But he couldn't hold his tuck or something. Well, his, it was his, he was his hamstring tuck and also this adductor. This wavering. Yeah, yeah, yeah wavering. That's, and you did aerobic testing. That's when you did aerobic testing. Yeah, the thing sometimes you'll get a combination of effects. Um, the um, a single muscle repeatedly tested can represent uh, a lack of iron, or a single muscle repeatedly tested, followed by repeatedly testing another muscle, another muscle, and they all weaken, represents a lack of fatty acids. So sometimes if you, if you test a muscle, it's a good idea to test another muscle repeatedly to see, is that a single muscle, which is an iron responsive muscle, or is it part of a group that is fat responsive? AK is a testing technique, it's a diagnostic technique, and that's how you do it. But if you're alert to the fact that the potential could be either iron, single muscle, or fatty acid, multiple muscle, it solves your question for you. From, if you just take what the, just the few things that Dr. Nair just talked about the last few minutes, you will look at what we talked about with Janet Travell, that she found that a high percentage of her patients needed either B12 or folic acid. And when Dr. Gard came back from Bandera, Texas, um, and that Rose Smith Memorial Lecture, um, he started testing B12 on people and found out that the fascial stretching and the fascial flushing technique was associated many times with the need for vitamin B12. And then we started doing that. That was the first identification of a pattern of a nutrient which could possibly affect anywhere in the body. Up to that time, the nutrient testing had been like using lung tissue for a lung problem or using kidney tissue for a kidney problem and then vitamin E for the gluteus medius or gluteus maximus muscles, vitamin C for the deltoid corporate brachial, specific nutrients for specific muscles. And he evolved all that work in the late 60s. And if you find a repeated weakness, recurrent weakness, say of a pectoralis major clavicular, you might look for a B vitamin. Or if you find a recurrent weakness of a, of a um, uh, uh, tensor fasciolata, you might look for something relating to the colon, acidophilus or something. Um, this was a breakthrough because what it started do, looking at was patterns of biochemical imbalance which could have unique effects in certain areas of the body or as Dr. Garcia said with the fatty acid testing all over the body. So we found out that there could be a fascial shortening of a muscle anywhere in the body and from putting Dr. Travell's work together with muscle testing, he identified that maybe what, 30%, 40% of those people might need vitamin B12.